Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, your one-stop shop for all things compliance related. I am pleased to announce a new service offering called the Compliance Alliance. This is a three-step program which will provide you and your team a background into compliance and the FCPA so you can consider how your products or services fits into this need, the needs of a compliance officer. It includes a boot camp around your products and services, a one-month podcast series featuring your product and services, and in-person training and consulting. Interested parties should contact Tom Fox at TomFoxLaw or at TFoxLaw.com. Today I have John Hansen, a.k.a. The Fraud Guy. However, I do not have him as his fraud guy capacity. I have him as the founder and chief executive officer of the International Association of Corporate Monitors, a nonprofit organization which is helping to bring transparency to the corporate monitorship process. John talks about how and why he formed the organization, the extraordinary amount of resources that he's collected and made available on the organization's website, and where he hopes to take the monitoring process going forward. The episode comes in at around 20 minutes. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and welcome to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, you are in for a real treat because we have the fraud guy himself, John Hansen, visiting with us. Well, not in his capacity as the fraud guy, in his capacity as the founder and CEO of the International Association of Independent Corporate Monitors. John, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. John, you have uh, worked as a corporate monitor, but in your role in the IAICM, you have worked very diligently over the past couple of years to set up professional standards and transparency around corporate monitors. Can you explain to us what the International Association of Independent Corporate Monitors was designed to be and uh, where you see it going now? Well, I'll start with saying a little bit about how it came to be, if that's okay. And, and what happened is I was running a very large monitorship um, back in, I don't know if it was 2008 or so, and I kept coming across issues that our team didn't know how to deal with. Just things that were different. They weren't particularly accounting issues or legal issues or compliance issues, but just issues that arose in the course of that monitorship that we struggled with and we couldn't tackle immediately. And what we found is, or what I found in leading that thing was I had nowhere to go to get any guidance about it. There were no standards. There were no best practices for monitors. There were no associations where you could go to uh, a fellow member or a leader of that organization and ask for that kind of guidance. And so it was at that time that I began to think that, wow, you know, maybe, maybe we need to create something like that. We need to put some best practices and standards together and create that sort of an organization. And that was sort of the, the beginning of the thought of, of IAICM. Um, in contemplating that, I met with a, a friend of mine who was also a monitor in a, in a massive monitorship and suggested to him the idea of creating standards and best practices uh, and an organization like this. And, you know, his response back was, wow, that sounds wonderful. It really would feel, fill a need that's not being currently met. And then he added, but if we were to just get our group together and do that, uh, and in his own kind of wise words, he said, no matter how great we perceive our own uh, credibility to be, we're just a bunch of people creating standards that nobody really has to care about. And so I kind of gave him a look and said, okay, so you're bursting my bubble here. And he said, no, not at all. He goes, but before you do this, I think we need to maybe work with the American Bar Association and try and get some standards for corporate monitors. And then I asked, well, how do we, how do, we do that? And he said, well, I think it just happened. Uh, and a, a couple of few months later, I get a call from the chair of the criminal justice section inviting me to be on a what was at that point an ad hoc task force on corporate monitors which was a committee of people to uh, study the topic and make a recommendation to criminal justice section about whether or not we should have standards. We did about 
a year and a half, two years of work on that, and uh, it was determined there needed to be standards, at which point the ad hoc task force was disbanded and a new formal standards committee was uh, put together. And we spent, I was lucky enough to move over from the ad hoc task force and join the standards committee. And we spent another two years writing what ultimately were passed in August of 2015, the ABA standards on corporate monitors. And as a result of that, once that was done, that's when I formed the entity and uh, began putting the pieces together to eventually get us to our launch. It took two years to get to the launch because the the, uh, the code of professional conduct that we have, it's a significant piece of work. We put together a, a wonderful committee comprised of uh, a variety of backgrounds and experiences. Most all of them had monitorship experience, though not necessarily so. Uh, and we wanted to look at all of these issues from uh, every sort of aspect that we could so that, you know, in the end, we would create a code of professional conduct that was robust, comprehensive, and and helpful, beneficial, practical, in fact, for people who are serving as, as independent corporate monitors. Three of the people who were on that committee were also three of the members of the ABA Standards Committee. And so our code of professional conduct is what I would say is congruous with the ABA Standards on corporate monitors, but it's it's more robust. It's different audiences. Ours are actual monitors, whereas the ABA standards is a bit broader. It, the ABA standards, for example, look to give more guidance to uh, host organizations and reporting agencies, whereas we're really focused on helping monitors be better monitors. So, John, you and I have both been involved uh, in the mo- it, uh, with monitors, as monitors, and in the monitors world for, uh, for myself since 2007. Uh, you you are um, around the same time, and and the profession, or rather the use of monitors, has evolved. And early on, I think there was a, a, a lot a lot of information not known about what monitor ships consisted of, how monitors uh, proceeded, or even how to select a monitor. Does the IAICM help address some of those issues? Yes. I mean, through through some of our work in talking to government agencies. Uh, so, for example, on April 12th, I'll be doing a presentation before the Interagency Suspension and Debarment Committee in Washington, D.C., to share information about our organization. But we've, you know, I've personally had a lot of interaction with various government officials, both in the development of the ABA standards and then, of course, in my work serving as a corporate monitor and trying to you know, bring out issues or concerns, uh, things that they might do a little bit different or a little bit better that would lead to to better monitorships. I mean, overall, you know, back in 2007, that was pre-Morford days, and those were the days when you know there were no there were no policies or practices really around corporate monitors. It was U.S. attorneys who would just appoint monitors uh, as they deemed appropriate, and government agencies could do the same thing. And it wasn't until uh, a controversy arose with the appointment of John Ashcroft uh, over Zimmer Holdings by then U.S. Attorney Chris Christie, uh, and there were five other appointments that he did as well. But that one led to a controversy, um, went quite public. Congress decided to look into it and started holding investigations into it. And that ultimately led to DOJ creating uh, policy. The Morford Memorandum was the first to come out around it which was in part to head off some proposed litigation that Congress was was putting out there about, you know, how DOJ would, would select and appoint monitors. And so that was sort of the, the initial state or beginning of, of a more transparent era around corporate monitoring. Uh, GAO did three reports after or in conjunction with those congressional hearings that uh, went, went on for probably another year, year and a half, and validated that DOJ was – abiding by its policy and was uh, selecting and using monitors in the way that it purported to be doing, which, you know, was brought a lot more transparency to the process. What I've found since then is, like, like often happens, many other government agencies, suspension and debarment agencies, local, state, whatever it might be, they sort of followed suit with DOJ. You know, DOJ does something and a lot of them kind of look to that as the way to do it, but not all of them. And so we still have agencies out there who don't have much transparency or any transparency in how they select or use monitors. Uh, you can't find policies in those agencies, or at least you know publicly you can't find them, that talks about how they select and use corporate monitors. 
And so I think the, the, as this practice area has grown and evolved, and it took a big hit. Let me go back real quick. But after the, the controversy in 2008, monitor ships really flattened out in terms of the trajectory that it was on at that point. And it, it, it stayed like that for about a year, and then it slowly started to creep back up. You started to see more and more. Now, I think it's back on that path of where it was back in the 2007 you know, and prior periods where you're seeing more and more monitors being being used in uh, corporate settlement agreements. Well, I mean, when a monitor comes in and does their job and does it right, um, it's a great thing for all the parties involved. I've had extremely good experiences, and I've now done – I've been appointed four times directly. I've led that fifth one, which was my first first one. And you know, I have wonderful relationships with those companies. They really appreciated the value and the service that I brought to them. Um, and, and the government was equally as happy because in the end, they were dealing with companies that they could then trust to, to have controls and corporate compliance and ethics policies in place that made a difference and made them more trustworthy and reduced the likelihood of any, any future misconduct. You know, that's a, that's a great point. I, I think I have shared with this with you, but I uh, heard uh, you on a panel at Compliance Week talking about a monitor ship at a corporation. And the next year I heard um, representatives from that company on a different panel oh, yeah. talk about <laughs> yeah, yeah. from their perspective. But yeah. what intrigued me was uh, that you both said, you know, it took a little while to, to get used to each other and to for the parties to agree on the program. But at the end of the day, both sides thought the company came out stronger, more robust, and most importantly, as you said, uh, having a level of um, trust with the gov- or the government, having a level of trust that they were going to do business appropriately going forward under the terms of the uh, deferred prosecution agreement or whatever the settlement document was, uh, as reflected in the monitorship agreement. So I don't think that, or I think that's not really uh, talked about enough or the positive benefits that can right. come out of a monitorship. Uh, even if it, it starts off a little bit rough or difficult at first, uh, I've seen numerous monitorships by the end of the relationship, uh, all parties appreciated, in, you know, including the government. So um, it, it's interesting to hear that. As you know, I practice generally in the anti-corruption space, and many companies and my listeners will be uh, familiar with monitors in the FCPA space, but it, monitorships are really much broader. Can you give a give us a sense of how broadly monitors can be used? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, you, you see a lot in the suspension and debarment space. So where a government contractor has, for example, a subcontractor or an employee who may uh, violate uh, organizational conflict of interest, for example, or uh, do something that creates a false claim to the government. Um, the, the government doesn't necessarily want to want to put those companies out of business because you know that that does a great deal more harm to the economy to the everybody. Uh, and so they look to come up with agreements that help. Uh, help that company build compliance and ethics programs that, you know, will ensure against that type of conduct in the future. Um, well, I say ensure against it. It will help prevent it. And if not prevent it, uh, be re- designed to reasonably detect it in, uh, in a reasonable period of time. Um, so you see a lot in the suspension and debarment space. World Bank has been doing them for years. So when they give money to different companies to, to fund different projects, um, if there's fraud or you know, some misconduct involved in those contracts, uh, they'll come back in and basically say, you know, we're going to withhold funding from you or debar you from any future funding pending your uh, accomplishment of these terms within an agreement. And again, in, in some of those cases, they'll impose a corporate monitor to ensure that the company is complying with those terms of the agreement or in many respects, help the company understand, you know, how to do that through through the monitor's recommendations. Um I see a lot coming out of uh, CFTC, FTC, uh, and some of the ones that you see out of FTC, there's no misconduct at all. It's a, it's a merger between uh, two companies that, you know, others may be concerned about creating some sort of a monopoly or unfair trading. And so they'll, they'll institute a monitor to look at various aspects to ensure that information is not being um, improperly exchanged 
uh, by those companies in the course of that merger. So, I mean, there's there's all sorts of different ways that a monitor can be put in there. There's regulatory, criminal, and then just contractual, if you will. I think what most people fail to realize is that most of the monitor ships that actually occur are, number one, they're not really all that huge in terms of the scope or the fees or the length of time, per se. And then, number two, they don't happen out of DOJ. They happen in all of these uh, other government uh, agencies, uh, federal, state, and you don't really see them on the local basis, though I've seen a few over the years. And then, of course, in, in the private sector with uh, organizations like World Bank. So, John, I'd like to now turn to the new website, the IAICM website, because this went live, I think, in February, and it's uh, it's really a great resource. Why don't you kind of describe uh, its genesis and uh, what you think are some of the highlights that are available to the general public on it? Absolutely. I mean, one of one of our core sort of charters, you know, if you will, under our you know mission and purpose is to create you know more awareness about what corporate monitors are, um, to to educate people about them, to create a certain degree of transparency around them. And so, you know, it, one of the goals in in uh, fulfilling that mission and purpose was to establish a website and maintain it that provides a whole lot of information, resources, uh, educational materials, articles, um, all that sort of information that people, the community and the public can access and find. The uh, <laughs> This was another reason why we took two years to actually launch IAICM is that, you know, over the last decade plus, I've been collecting agreements. You know, anytime a new agreement would come out that required a monitor, you know, I'd just tag it, bag it, as we'd say in the bureau. I, I was, I'm a former FBI agent. And, you know, we'd go into a file and just kind of sit there. You know, some of them might have been an opportunity that I would pursue. But for the most part, I would just grab them and throw them into files. And I collected a couple few hundred of these things over the years. Um, what I wanted to do with my vision in building something that that presented this to people and made it something usable was to to create a database that mirrors kind of if your users are FCPA involved uh, the the Sherman and Sterling site that that has a, a database of FCPA matters. Um, I kind of modeled our our site our public resource center, I should say, of our site on that. So what it does is there's agreements, those agreements that I've collected, not all of them, we're still, we're still actually data entering historically, uh, have been data entered in there so that you can search our database by the underlying misconduct or by the government agency or a particular time period or other variable parameters, and it will pull up for you a list of all of the agreements and all of these required monitors that comply with those search parameters. Then if you click on one, a nice little one-page table comes up that provides uh, a clear picture of all, all of the relevant areas um, as it regards the monitorship associated with that agreement, uh, the term of the monitorship, meaning the number of years, the reporting agencies, the underlying misconduct, the scope of the monitorship, all that sort of stuff. If there was a, if there was a restriction associated with the monitor, so for example, some agencies say a monitor can't have any thing to do with a business for at least one year after the end of a monitorship. You know, if it noted that, we captured that, and it's in there. And then at the very bottom of it. If you really want to go deep and research more, you can actually pull up the agreement and go to town on it. You can read it, read it all. If there's other relevant agreements, so for example, um, a recent one was Western Union. There was a, a DOJ DPA, there was a FTC consent order, and then there was an OFAC uh, agreement of some type. I can't remember exactly what it was entitled. Well, the 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 DPA from DOJ and the OFAC order sort of incorporated into them the independent compliance auditor, which when you look at the scope, it's the definition of a monitor in the FTC agreement. So really, the FTC agreement is the agreement of most associated with the monitor. Well, you can get all three of them right there on the website. So you can look at all of, the, all of these various agreements, see how they tie together. So from a research perspective, you know, for just a user, it's really amazing. You know, there's nowhere else you can go to and find all of these agreements in this sort of format where you can you can structure your searches to pinpoint uh, areas of interest. Um, 
And we're, we're, I think there's about 150 agreements in there right now, and we've got another 100 uh, or so that still have to be data entered. We have a law firm that's uh, that's volunteered to help us get that done this summer. So hopefully we'll we'll have a, a extremely robust database by the time the um, the fall hits. And then there's also a reference library that we've uh, built into the public resource center, and that's just sort of a you know, it's very simplistic. It's just a listing uh, with links to all sorts of relevant information associated with monitors. Everything from some really, really deep white papers that deep people have done over the years uh, around this topic to just articles that have come out to government publications. Um, I mentioned, for example, that GAO had done these three reports uh, at the request of Congress as part of those hearings into the Zimmer Holdings matter. Well, all three of those reports are right there. You can find them, you know, one, two, three in a row. Uh, if you, any of the memos, you know, people talk about Morford and Thompson and all of those other memos that, that came out, they're all right there. The U.S. Attorney's Manual, the Federal Sentencing Guidelines. Uh, there was even a group that came together, I think, in 2008 and did sort of a uh, best practices guidance for police monitors. Um, which is actually very, very well done. Um, that's up on the site, too. So it's sort of a one-stop shop. You know, if you're a reporter or a student who's doing a paper on this topic, you have one place that you can go to and you can find all this. Now, conversely, if you're a government agency, you're, if you're an official in an agency that's contemplating the use of monitors or is reevaluating policies that you're using, again, you have one place that you can go to and you can find all this information which can help you, you know, work through that process. And if the, if the re reference library isn't enough, you can go pull up agreements by other other agencies and get a good sense of, okay, well, here's maybe what my agreement should look like, you know, if I'm going to restructure it and, or reorganize it. You can get all those ideas in there. Um, so it's, it's really, it's an amazing uh, repository of information. It's getting a lot of, uh, of activity as well. It's, it's probably the most uh, clicked on um, area of our website, which frankly, we, we fully anticipated that. Well, John, if someone wanted to uh, uh, be considered for membership in the IAICM, how would they uh, do so? Well, the best place to start is, again, on our website. Under the Members tab, there's a, a drop-down for qualifications. And so that kind of outlines what uh, the membership committee that we have, which consists of, of five different people, um, these are the things that they're looking for in determining whether or not you know, to admit somebody as a member. You know, it was, it was important for, for me when we were, you know, as beginning this thing that we be open to people who have obviously never been a monitor or have never had served in a monitorship, whether as a forensic accountant or uh, assisting counsel or expert capacity, whatever it might be. Because, you know, the truth of it is so many people who get chosen to be a monitor have never been a monitor before. But that doesn't mean they can't be a good monitor. They have a good background um, of, of varied background, uh, good depth of experience, all of the prerequisites that would you know make for a good monitor. And so we we kind of outline on our on our website what are the factors. So obviously direct. Monitorship experience is a big plus. If you've been a monitor before, you got a pretty good chance that it's not going to be a hard decision for a membership committee. Um, indirect experience where you've been, say, a forensic accountant under a monitor, you know, um, we, we would want to understand what, what you did, what was the nature of it, and, you know, what was your role in it. And then we look at your, just your general experience across, uh, you know, a pretty extensive group of areas. Uh, that the membership committee in devising these qualification guidelines uh, thought were important to to being an effective corporate monitor. So everything from academic work to, you know, being uh, somebody on the other end at the government who was overseeing monitors. I mean, it varies quite a bit. White collar defense attorneys, forensic accounting people, um, corporate compliance and ethics professionals. You know, all of that experience is, is, is looked at. And our application, you know, is structured along the same path as, as our guidelines. So, you know, you fill out an application, you uh, send it in, um, and the membership committee reviews it, assesses it. If they need more information, they usually will go back to you and, and get it, and then they make a decision. Um, it was structured in a way, like I said, to be open 
open. We want to admit people that we, we believe are qualified and would make good candidates, consistent, of course, with, with our code, which is really at the heart of, of our, our organization. Um, but at the same time, you know, not admit people who, you know, for example, that, that third year associate just, you know, practically out of law school, that person's not going to make a good monitor. They just don't have good experience or enough experience to really do that sort of job at that point in their, in their career. So, you know, like I said, it's, um, it's right. It's really on the web. It's the easiest way to do it. Uh, I've encouraged people. I've had some people call me directly to just kind of say, hey, what do you think? And I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to share some thoughts with them about the best way to apply and whether or not their experience might might be helpful or not at that point in time. John, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but I was wondering if anyone uh, had any questions and they wanted to follow up with you directly, could they email you? And if so, how would they do it? Absolutely. Uh, easiest way is J Hanson, H A N S O N, at I A I C M dot org. So J Hanson at I A I C M dot org. Well, John, I wanted to really thank you not only for taking the time to visit with me today, for but for really working as hard as you have. I, I think I've known you for now seven years, and you've been really laboring over this and on this. It's a incredibly important and useful resource, and I think the uh, not only my compliance community folks, but uh, the greater compliance community in a wide variety of industries are going to benefit from your work. So on behalf of me, thank you. Thank you, Tom. That means a lot. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Once again, the link to uh, the IAICM website is IAICM.org. Go ahead and check that out for a, a wealth of materials around monitors and settlement agreements under the FCPA in a wide variety of cases. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us as it would help our rankings and help us get out more information to a broader audience of this compliance offering in my compliance podcast network. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you'll join me for the next episode of the FCPA Compliance Report.